My name is Giovanni Nisato. I'm an innovation and uh, project uh, manager, and I work at Innovation Horizons, a company that I started last year. And I'm a volunteer with PMI Switzerland, and I'm part of the event team in Basel. So it's a great pleasure to welcome you for this webinar with the theme of learning to unlearn. And um, I'll spend a couple of minutes of, of introduction. So today we uh, I'll give you a couple of messages on behalf of PMI Switzerland, some, uh, some numbers just to orient yourself about the organization. Then there will be a, the actual webinar and uh, um, the Q&A will be integrated. I'll spend a couple of uh, words on that point later. And uh, we will close the session with some feedback and uh, future events and other announcements. So today the event will be recorded and will be available later on on the PMI uh, Switzerland social media. Uh, you're muted during the call. Uh, please use the Q&A button to post your questions and please do so during the actual uh, webinar. If you are a PMI frequent flyer on webinars, you will realize that what we're doing now is actually a bit different than usual. Usually we ask people to answer questions at the very end. Here we're asking you to ask the questions as they come to your mind because they will be answered at specific points during the session. So that's part of doing things differently today. Uh, you will get uh, the slides after the event and uh, uh, also we're very grateful for any feedback you would like to share with us to make this series of webinar more uh, effective in the future. So welcome everybody. It's uh, personally the first time I'm hosting a PMI Switzerland event. And uh, I can say that this story started uh, for me quite a while ago. Uh, it took about a year to get to the event we have tonight. And uh, just before we continue, I think we have a, a poll now to um, have an indication of where you all are, are, uh, are from. And um, this is also a bit to break the ice and also to, to have an understanding of the people uh, that, are, that are here with us. So it may be a couple of, uh, um, couple of seconds for you to, uh, to answer where are you from? Where are you tuning from? Where are you calling in from tonight? And uh, the poll is closed, but I, yeah, I'm actually, I'm actually uh, not able to see the results. Oh, here it is. So we have a majority of uh, people calling in from Switzerland, which is not a big surprise, but actually about 20% from other European countries, which could be France or Germany, which do count, count as other European countries, but um, having seen the region of Basel, that's maybe not so far, but we might have people that are calling from further away. So it's a real pleasure to have uh, all of you here tonight with us. So a few words, and you're not meant to be uh, reading and memorizing all of this. It's uh, just to tell you that uh, there is a, a quite active uh, Project Management Institute chapter in Switzerland which is quite active. And uh, one of the things that we do is organizing events such as tonight uh, that uh, are helpful for those of you that are interested in honing your skills at keeping uh, yourself active and learning new things, but also reaching out, networking. And um, uh, myself, this is actually how I got in touch with PMI. I can only encourage you to attend different meetings, get engaged, get involved, and exchange your experiences, and eventually be, be part of it and, and give back to the community. And there's plenty of ways you can do that. Again, you will get a copy of the slide so you can study all the, all the numbers in more detail. Please um, also don't forget to look at different uh, channels for social media from LinkedIn to YouTube to Twitter. And um, these are also channels when you are members of PMI to advertise or to get in touch with uh, the community. So please do get in touch with our social media team. We are a website if you have some special announcements, posts or, or things that 
think are not worthy and you would like to, to share with the community. So tonight is about learning to unlearn. And uh, the, the picture you, you see here is a, maybe a bit of a metaphor because um, often in our, in our practice as project managers, we, we learn quite hard some skill sets. So it's a bit like climbing on a, on, a, on a cliff or on a mountain, or in this case, a small hill. And then you have more visibility and you realize that perhaps you need to do something else. Like this person might have to learn how to jump in the water and swim to get to the next rock and climb that one again. Um, this event tonight was originally planned last uh, February and it was before COVID. So it feels like a lifetime ago. And in the meantime, we had to schedule it and schedule it and reschedule it different ways. And I'm very happy that we're finally able tonight to welcome Kasia Andreska. She is a person that has a very interesting um, set of experiences and uh, uh, has lived, she will introduce herself more, more thoroughly when she starts her talk, but uh, she has a lot of experience in, uh, in different areas, different cultures, different geographies in large companies, which uh, in, enabled her to experience uh, different kinds of complexities. But then she also uh, switched off and, 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 and learned to unlearn your in her in her own way and, and, um, and give back to communities in different parts of the world. So it's a great pleasure to welcome Kasha tonight. I will be helping her with the slides. So if there are some hiccups with that, it's, uh, it's my fault. And uh, for the rest, um, I'm sure that we will have some, an interesting time with her. Kasha will be um, stopping at different points in time during her talk to interact with you via the questions that you ask with the Q&A. And, &A. and um, uh, one of the uh, people that is helping today, Leon, and I will introduce the, the team facilitating the entire event tonight at, at the very end, uh, will probably um, help her by reading out the, the questions that, that you're asking in the Q&A. So Kasha, the floor is yours and I'm gonna uh, mute myself. You're in mute, Kasha. Ah, I thought I clicked it. Thank you, Thank you Giovanni, and uh, good evening to everybody. And I'm really delighted to spend this evening today with you. And hopefully, I do understand you cannot actually talk in this presentation, but fortunately, you can write. So I encourage you to write your questions, your comments, and hopefully, it will be a little bit uh, interact interactive session. So uh, uh, Giovanni already introduced a little bit uh, myself and I would like to tell you a little bit who I am as a person and then moved to a professional career and then of course discuss the points about learning and learning, uh, et cetera. So, so who is Kasia? In summary, she is married to the mountains. It's true. You will see throughout my presentation. I'm spending almost every weekend with my friends and family in the mountains. I am really in love with very simple people and I like doing what I can't. Am I always successful? No, but I try. So um, uh, I was born in Poland and this was still a communist time. So um, my, my brother and sister are significantly older than me. And therefore I was the youngest child in the family. And you could certainly call me a spoiled brat. And because of it, that it was a communist regime. So I was growing up with the mindset that this is perfectly all right to cheat and perfectly all right to break the rules. And the overall environment was really focusing on weaknesses. Even though I was top student in the school, I have never heard that I've done something good. It was always what I have to improve. So when I was 20, I kind of figured it out, nope, I would like to actually run away from Poland. And uh, it was not easy. The only country I could go was Greece. So I took with the Polish Airlines to Greece and from there I was planning to go to United States. This was my destination. However, I happened to be on a hijacked plane while leaving Poland. 
and uh, we had a Greek hijacker who didn't want to go to Greece, but he actually wanted to go to Frankfurt. And as you can imagine, this was, I think, first situation in my life where I was totally outside of control. There is not much that you can do. And it was really scary. We were going up and down and captain was under, was out control. Uh, we simply had a Greek guy who had a little gran granite and he wanted to go to Frankfurt. And when I reflect back at this situation, I remember very well what I was thinking. My first thought was, uh oh, maybe this is not so bad. Frankfurt would be much better than Athens because from there I can much faster get to United States. So what I'm trying to say that in this tragic situation where it seems you really cannot control anything, I was able to control my mindset, my thoughts. And actually this whole adventure for me was probably not as bad as it would be otherwise. Anyway, I'm sure you would like to know what happened. We did go back to uh, Poland and on the board there was a Polish actor who was very good with martial art and he had a little fight with the pilot in the cabin and somehow caught the hijacker. So yeah, I was actually on TV. Anyway, so after, after two weeks <clears throat> I did land in San Francisco with three dollars in my pocket and I had to organize my life there. And as I already mentioned that I was in this culture of cheating is okay, focus on weaknesses. I learned very quickly in the United States that I have a lot to unlearn. And the Americans were wonderful. They were always helping me, but I had to learn how not to cheat, how not to break the rules. I tell you my first exam at San Francisco State University, test. So in Poland, you can study, you can be well prepared, and I always was prepared. But then when you go to take a test, you build a little cheat notes. Maybe in some of your countries, you also do it. Maybe it's also typical for Poland. So you write everything, even though you have it in your head, you still write it. And then during the test, during the exam, you obviously check if what you wrote is indeed correct. And if the professor leaves the classroom, wow, everybody starts making noise. So here is my first test at San Francisco State. I have all my cheat sheets. Immediately after starting the test, the professor left the classroom. <clears throat> I was really surprised. It would never happen in Poland. So I'm ready to make a noise and ask other people and take my uh, piece of paper, the cheating sheet, and it's quiet, quiet, quiet. And that's what Americans taught me. Life is not about cheating, but about being honest. And you think that this is so simple, right? It's not difficult to be honest. It was tough for me. With my boyfriend, when we were in the mountains hiking, there is a sign do not enter, trail closed. I even didn't pay attention to it. It was perfectly okay to break a rule and go there, but no, I couldn't do it. So, so this journey of unlearning started for me very, very early and it was not easy. But if you are in a situation where you are, little by little, you have to unlearn and become honest. And the most important in the United States, recognize the strength and then have fun in everything that you do. So um, as still living in the United States, I've got the opportunity to live in other countries. And I totally decided to lose myself into adventure and try what I can still unlearn and learn. I happened to be for a year and a half in Nigeria. This was again, brand new experience for me. So growing up, growing up in Poland under communist regime, I was going to church, I was a Catholic, but my relationship with God was going to church service just you know, on Sundays. And here in Nigeria, Nigerian people taught me about brand new relationship with God. I know you are surprised that I'm talking about it, but it had, big impact on how I run 
project program in Nigeria. So this relationship that they taught me, I will be bringing it up, fundamentally changed the way as I'm thinking. Then I had opportunity to live for over a year in China. And uh, I have to tell you, I love Chinese people. They are so pragmatic, they are so creative. And if you empower them, I'm telling you, they can move the mountains. So great experience and we'll share with you a few stories. And finally, I had an opportunity, as Giovanni mentioned, to take one year off from my professional uh, career and do volunteering work. Uh, I worked in Alta Vera Pass in Guatemala uh, with the Mayan community. And I also spent um, three months uh, in refugee camp in Moria. Outstanding experiences. And if you ever have opportunity to do something very different, I strongly encourage you because what I learned in this one year, I wanted to go there to give everything that I learned, but I gained much more than I gave away. And it was a great experience of, of learning about what really true empathy is. It was also about focusing on influence rather than concern. Yeah, concerns, we have a lot of concerns, but we don't do anything about it. So influence is something that matters. Good, so let's move a little bit now um, to my professional career. And I was very lucky to be quite successful. And it is not because of just me, but what I call it, the power of we. Was always working in teams, with teams, and together making a difference. So in 1994, I believe, Giovanni, if you click one more time, I started working uh, for Accenture uh, in San Francisco office. And uh, my mindset at that time was still kind of, I, Kasia, as a genius, I know everything the best because that's pretty much how they drive your mindset at the university. I had to switch when I uh, joined Accenture. It was not anymore about me, but it was about a collective genius. It's each of us is a slice of genius, but when you put a team together, it's a collective genius. It's nothing that I invented this term is Linda Hill from Harvard University, and I will be talking about it later on. And if I reflect back at a company like Accenture, that's what we do. We put rightfully a team together with a different skill set, and we can call ourselves a collective genius. So, as you see, I worked in a few other countries. I'm listening, I'm listing here also in Netherlands and UK and, and Switzerland. Uh, many, many different clients. I just listed here a few. And would like to highlight to you one interesting role that I had. I think you as project managers are all familiar with the status reports. Yeah, we have to prepare them. We ask others to fulfill them. And one of my most beautiful and effective status reports was the one in Nigeria. So I already mentioned that this is a very religious culture. And for example, in Nigeria, when a manager writes an email to a manager, a greeting that goes, um, greetings in the name of our Lord is normal. I was really shocked during the first month because coming from United States where we are not even allowed to talk about religion and we are punished when we say Merry Christmas because we are supposed to say Happy Holidays. For me, it was shock to see how God is being used formally in the business. So three months before the go life of SAP Lee implementation, I was asked to join, to join prayer meetings for a successful go life. And it was happening uh, twice a week. Formally, it was scheduled. And in my room, I had 15 different work stream leads. And each of them very powerfully was praying for everything that is still not working. 
for issues in testing, for issues with data uh, cleanup, data migration, etc. And I'm telling you, I took this as the opportunity to really know what is still not working. And it was so passionate, it was so to the point, and it gave me such an excellent information later on what to focus on. But it was taking the opportunity of the moment, yeah, and of the culture. And that's why I really wanted to share with you. And then in 2006, I believe I joined Roche. And um, I've been there still working as a consultant from Accenture. And then um, because of it that I've got a nice offer, I decided to work for Roche. And I'm here until this moment. I had a lot of great roles. And working at Roche, it is more about not really change management, but evolution management, because things are changing so quickly that we cannot talk anymore about change management because there is no end of a change. Yeah, you probably all know about it. So I run uh, quite, few quite few programs as the organizational change management lead for business transformation. And a few times I was taking quite calculated risks when I did not necessarily agree with the direction that the project or program was taking. And we will be talking later on about calculated risks. I just would like to highlight one today when I was the manager for the innovation program um, and uh, Duke University was the one that was selected for many good reasons. It's an excellent university that has great reputations of developing strategic training learning programs for Roche. However, I quickly figured it out with my team that Carnegie Mellon University is a fit for purpose. But then when it came to decide with which university you want to go, I was the only one who voted for Carnegie Mellon University and five senior executives voted for Duke. And I decided to challenge it, to take a calculated risks, as I call it. And it took me two months to actually switch between Duke and CMU. I think this was about seven years ago and this program exists still until today. And it's a wonderful relationship with CMU. But I'm saying this to encourage you to sometimes be brave and, and challenge, and as I call it, take calculated risks. I will be talking more later on about China, so we'll not mention it. Just another example, I, it's a weaker program. It's a program for um, customer center, for a call center, you can call it, where we've been taking people through just a few hours uh, training about customer experience and I also challenged it and decided to propose something very different to really change the mindset of people who work in those call centers. And we created so-called experience expeditions where we were taking them for the trips. Since Roche, as you probably all know, is a pharmaceutical company, we organized for them visits to the patients, visits to the scientists, because this group of people were not scientists and it make a huge impact how they perceive customer experience going forward. Again, this program, well, now actually it doesn't exist, but it was run for about three or four years. So long lasting programs. But again, I challenged myself because I wanted to do something very different from what you would normally have. And finally, uh, a little bit of professional um, experience, but as a humanitarian work, I already mentioned, I worked with Choice Humanitarian in Guatemala. We worked on several humanitarian projects such as medical uh, establishing of hospital, environmental, economical, and educational programs. And then in Moria, in Greece, uh, in refugee camp, I worked with three organizations, Teach Beyond, Euro Relief, and Drop in the Ocean, um, working directly with refugees as well as with uh, volunteers. Good, so this is a little bit who is Kasia. So now let's move to main sections of the presentation. 
and I have selected four components for today and I will explain each of them and then at the end of uh, each section um, we will open the floor for questions or comments and then we will move to the second uh, component. So the four elements that I have selected for today, the first one, the first one is focus on relationships. Second is being purpose driven rather than process driven. Then it's about maximizing our learning versus minimizing risks. And the last one is focus on strength rather than trying to improve our weaknesses. So let's start with the focus on relationships. For, 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 for many years, I was like you, um, a different type form of the project manager, program manager, um, including organizational change management, but not only. I was also the program manager for setup of shared services center. This was the job that I done in China. I was also leading implementation of SAP system. Yeah, so variety of project management roles. And I have to be, and I, and I have to tell you, already two years after I started working for Accenture, my coach gave me first feedback that it was a little bit of eye opening for me. He said, Kasia, you have to lighten up. You are so, so task driven. You are very good in completing all your tasks, but you, you have to lighten up. So I think that we all are familiar with the term time is money. And I'm saying really, perhaps relationships is what really matters and it's trust. And when I was in Nigeria, Nigerian people, I think you are familiar with the statement. Nigerian people says that here in Switzerland, we make, we have beautiful watches, but in Nigeria, people have time. And time means trust, means relationship. So I give you a couple of examples. The first one is from Guatemala. We've been asked to select a farmer for cardamom. So one of the work that we've been doing is collaborating with uh, non-for-profit organizations and uh, one of them was buying from our organization Choice Humanitarian the best possible cardamom. So cardamom I think you know it's a spice and the leader organization a Mayan person and myself um, we promised to our American counterparts that in the afternoon we will let them know who the partner, the part, the farmer is going to be. So we left in the morning to a couple of farmers and we arrived to the first of them. And it was around nine o'clock and uh, it was everything in Spanish and in Kachi, local language. And uh, I can see my, my leader from Choice Humanitarian to, to start discussion talking about cardamom. So I thought, all right, first it's, you know, a little bit of, of a talk about the weather, but it is already third hour and we still are only with wife. We play with the children and, you know, we don't talk about cardamom at, at, at all. And this is already fifth, sixth, seventh hour. And we still play with the children. The wife gave us something to eat. Then around five, six o'clock in the evening, the actual farmer comes, but we don't talk about cardamom. He's showing us some of his machines that are not working. Uh, one machine to, to, to make uh, corn tortillas. And we don't talk about cardamom at all. It's already dark. We take the machine that is not working and we put on our car and we said that we will repair it. No talk about cardamom. We go there back the second day and it's more or less the same situation. We have right now the fixed machine and only second day around five o'clock, the farmer finally shows the crop and we start looking at it. And we've done the same with the second farmer. Now, 
I know you will say it wouldn't be possible to do anything like Switzerland. We go directly to the business. But I have to tell you how effective it was. Investment of time by my leader to meet the family, to meet both farmers and to decide with whom we want to work. It was this building a relationship, recognizing who we are, and at the end, choosing the far farmer that was really fit for purpose. Of course, for me, this was something very difficult to deal with. I was so impatient, yeah? And also we promised Americans that we will tell them, you know, after four hours who it is. I was extremely impatient, but I knew that there's something good about it. And it is a big learning for me, really what relationship matters. Another example from Nigeria, and uh, there I think I, I was a little bit better when it comes to relationships and it worked perfectly. So as I arrived to Nigeria, there was a chaos because we had Accenture people and Shell people. Shell was our client. We had local Nigerian people and we had expats. A lot of people from UK and from Netherlands and I was from, from San Francisco, from, from United States. And my job was to bring a peace among different parties because I played the role of organizational change manager. So the first three weeks that I spent there was really indeed building this relationship with Nigerian people and learning about everything that they have done. From expats, I heard constantly, Nigerians don't know anything. They don't follow global processes. They have their local needs. It doesn't make any sense to what they want to achieve. And as I consolidated those findings, I brought them to the steering committee where I had Nigerian Shell senior leaders, as well as some expats. And when I showed appreciation for everything that Nigerian team put together, this was breaking the ice. From that time on, I and Nigerian people, we had this trust and relationship. But I tell you, the expats didn't like me. You know, I heard a lot of comments. You came here to bring the peace and you take sight of Nigerian people. So now with Nigerian people, we had to learn how to bring on board expats. And again, you may believe it or not, but as I already told you, it was highly religious group. Nigerian people told us we have to pray for those expats. We have to breathe on them, love and peace. And perhaps it was a miracle or perhaps not, but just having this positive attitude of one side to another, it indeed created peace and love. And it took us probably six weeks, a, a month and a half to have one team working together very successfully. And the whole project lasted a year and a half. So this was a very good investment of building relationships, but also experimenting something different. So I would like to now ask you to reflect a little bit. And if you could think about a person with whom you had a very good relationship, trustful relationship, and think back how easy it is to collaborate with a person with whom you have a good trust. And then think of somebody where this relationship is not really so good because there is no trust and how the collaboration looked like. I'm quite sure that the answers are easy for you. And maybe if we reflect back to our current situation, we all know that COVID is horrible. At the same time, is it a little bit like with my flight, hijacked flight, it was horrible. However, I tried to find the best out of it. Is there something that COVID can allow us to practice? So if you have any questions, comments, just comments are also uh, good. Let, let, let's pause for a second. Uh, this is Leon. Please feel free to use the chat 
or the Q&A and we will be able to communicate with Kasia. So Kasha, this is Giovanni speaking. Is um, I can also see the Q and A. By the way, I see that perhaps people are a bit uh, uh, a bit shy or not used to this uh, to this format yet. Um, maybe a, a a reflection on on your presentation. You, you decided to um, to still go ahead in this uh, uh, COVID times, and I know that uh, there were different moments of. Uh, uh, also for, from your side of thinking, how are you going to present this? And I'll just move, I'll, I'll just um, stop now because there are a lot of the, more people um, writing comments, but maybe a few words on, on how do you see this um, trust building in the digital space uh, with Zoom and, and all these tools that we have? How do you see the, the relationship building and trust building in the digital space? So uh, Giovanni, a very good question. Thank you, thank you very much for this. And uh, we have to take opportunity of every situation, right? And we say in Poland, if you don't have what you like, which is normal face-to-face uh, -face interaction, you have to like what you have. So my personal experience is that COVID and being together first of all, allowed me and my colleagues to learn much more about ourselves that we would have known if it wouldn't be for coronavirus. And for, for Roche, as you know, I'm working right now at Roche, it took a while before we were able to have a background. As you see, I have right now an elephant background, but it only came very, very recently. For most of the time, we could actually see where we are. And quite frequently, we could also see our family members who were passing by. And it was actually beautiful and we appreciated this because everybody all of the sudden could enter something that is very private to us, yeah, our homes. But it did build a relationship. It did help us to learn much more about ourselves. Now, even if you have the background, what we've been practicing is having, we call it virtual coffee or huddles. And it's half an hour every week, depending on what teams you are. And it's really having coffee. It's just having coffee and doing nothing else, which means talking what's on our minds, talking about our challenges, not related to work, but related to us as human beings. So I found it very helpful because it also started building the relationships that otherwise wouldn't be built, right? And then, and, and, and this is what I really appreciate. I also observed in my working environment that we have more appreciation, simply saying thank you becomes extremely important, recognition by the senior leaders for the work that we do, but not only peer to peer. And that's what I treasure. And I, I would imagine it's most likely similar in your working environments. Hi, Kisha, thank you. We have a couple of questions. One of them is done, it's a more a comment uh, from uh, Michel Logiaco, sorry for my pronunciation, is uh, the pandemic is really jeopardizing all kinds of human relationship. How would you deal with this uh, current COVID and human relationship? And then I need to follow two more questions, one from Mervin and one from Heiko. Okay, so, so Heiko, uh, could you please uh, repeat the, yeah. the, 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 the question itself? How would yes. you? Uh, the, the this comment question, it says uh, literally, I believe this pandemic is really jeopardizing all kind of human relationship. It's more like a comment, general, uh, 
general comment. How would you deal with that? So I'm, I'm sure since you make these comments, that's most likely what happened, yeah? So I, I will not comment about what happens in private life because, yeah, that's what we have to manage uh, individually. And perhaps this question is focusing more um, on, on private uh, situations. I will relate to, to, to the business life and maybe somebody else could make a comment about this question. And, and also right there, um, I, I have to tell you that uh, already what I started explaining that for us in the business, COVID actually brought us to get together closer. Yeah, via, via those examples that I already explained. Maybe the other one that I didn't say before is that when we start the meetings these days, we never jump directly to the business. Never, never. And if it is a one-on-one -on -one meeting, for example, if I meet with somebody on my team, we take good 10, 15 minutes to talk about overall situation, what happens, and also how we can help each other. So that's at least what I am practicing. And uh, as a result, I cannot say myself that COVID jeopardized my relationships. And it's the same with the family. I am here in Switzerland by myself. My family is in Germany, Poland, and the United States. And we organize literally every weekend. Different team, uh, different family members organizing it. We have drinks, we have dinners, uh, we drink coffee. So I think that we are in transition right now, yeah, to the new normal. And if you try to be connected, you can. And this is my answer. For me personally, COVID didn't jeopardize any single relationship. Of course, it's difficult. I cannot touch my mom. I cannot touch my brother. I cannot touch my friend. But I am in touch with them because technology allows. Yeah. Thank you so much, Kasia. Uh -huh. And uh, yeah. Uh, sorry, um, Leon, do you want to go? To go next for the next comment or question? Yes, I think we have two related questions, uh, Mervin and Heiko, and uh, it's called, one of them is, uh, have you been in a situation where, where trust was broken and how did you manage to build back? And uh, the question from Heiko, which is very similar, is I agree with you, the interaction with people you are trust, understand, and have empathy is way more easier. What do you do if you have hurdles to build this at the beginning of a project? Mm -hmm. Very good, excellent question. So hopefully I have a good answer for you. So trust, what is trust? There's actually a formula for trust. Trust is um, between two people. It's the skills, functional, technical skills, that we have, plus social skills, how we relate to each other, do we have the same chemistry, intimacy between us, plus reputation, and all divided by self-interest. So if somebody is really interested in myself, so self-interest and not about this building relationship, the trust level will be very low. On the other hand, if I am not a selfish person, I really care for this relationship. But for example, my skill set, technical skill set is really low. They're not going to be a good trust. For example, think about a doctor who is a wonderful person, always smiles to you, is great, but really hardly knows his business, yeah? hardly knows how to advise you. Are you going to trust this doctor? Probably not. On the other hand, you can have a doctor who is great, fantastic, is doing excellent operations, but you don't have any chemistry with this doctor. He treats you like an object. Is there a trust? Probably not. And two different people will choose two different doctors, right? So, so how do we build this trust? We, we both have to be aware that in order to have a good relationship, 
the self-interest in me needs to be very low, but I have to demonstrate certain technical skills, social skills, and then there's also a factor of reputation. So if two people are building relationship and they really are open and they can discuss, they can discuss why something is not working, but it of course requires transparency. And what we recommend is so-called 10 minutes. If you have a difficult relationship with somebody, it's so-called 10 minutes walk. One person talks for 10 minutes, what's on his, her mind in this relationship, and then another person, right? But that's how they build, rebuild the trust. And you can rebuild trust. It's not true that once trust is gone, you cannot regain it. So this is a little bit longer answer, but hopefully did leave you a little bit of points to think. And maybe I would ask now Giovanni that we move on because time is running and I still have three components to discuss. I, I'm glad you point that out. There are more questions. I, I, I propose we try to see if we can take them at the, at the very end. Yes. And if, there are if they are still relevant for the next uh, sessions, we, we take them then. Good, so let's move to the purpose, because this one is also very important. So um, following the purpose creates a psychological safety. What does it mean? So probably many of us have been in the situation or even are at this moment, especially during co Corona times, that we are not sure if we will have our job tomorrow, next year, right? But if we worked for the good purpose, we create this psychological safety. So for example, I can only talk about myself. I know that I work for the great person. The mission of Roche is doing now what patients need next. And every day at work, I try to do everything to follow this purpose. I feel so much better because the fact that I may not have a job next year is already reduced because I know that today I'm doing something great. The second factor is that as I'm doing something great, I'm developing new skills. I'm following the purpose, I'm developing new skills. Therefore, I also feel much better because if I lose this job, I will be able to take those skills somewhere else. Yeah, so that's why I'm always saying following the purpose is very, very important. Now, I give you two examples where it's not so easy to follow the purpose because we are driven by the purpose. And especially we see it as a project managers, yeah? If you have a waterfall methodology or agile methodology, when you, when you move from uh, define, design, build and test, you always have steps, processes to follow. And quite frequently we forget what is our purpose? What is our vision? Example from Moria camp in Greece. So when we distribute food to um, uh, refugees, there is a rule, there is a process. We can only distribute the food to refugees if we have enough for everybody. And if we have enough steaks or vegetables for half of the refugees, we don't distribute because the assumption is that those who get, who didn't get the food, will fight with those who got the food. And this will create a social unrest. So as a result, at 10 o'clock in the evening, when it's dark, all this food is being put outside. But it's very hot in Greece at summertime. So usually by 10 o'clock, this food is spoiled and it's not good anymore. So my team and I decided to challenge this process. It's a rule created by the government, by United Nations and you know, a few other pro project managers. And we were very lucky. It took us one week to change the rule. And one day at noon, when we had too many stakes, when we didn't have enough stakes for everybody, we did display them. As guess what? None of the refugees were fighting for it. The other way around, they were sharing this food that was out there, yeah? So our assumption was that they will fight with each other, but they actually greatly appreciated 
and shared with each other. And we followed the pur purpose, yeah? The purpose for us in this refugee camp was to put a refugee in the center and do everything we can do the best for them. There was another example with distributing clothes. When we were picking up refugees from the, from the sea, they were wet, they were, they were wet, they were stinking, and it took usually five hours to process them through administrative matters. And around nine o'clock in the evening, they would get their toiletries and fresh, clean clothes. And it happened on occasion that somebody would get a clothes that didn't fit him or her. But the process was, we don't do any exchanges in the evening. The process is, they have to come in 24 hours at a designated point. So some people had to sleep in the stinky clothes, yeah, because their clothes was not really good because what they've got was bad. And I am sure you can think of similar examples that are happening in your work environment where we blindly follow the process, not really thinking what's the purpose of our work. And I will give you now an example from my project that I am very proud of that is more realistic for you. Again, it was an implementation. We were in the middle of the design phase. We should complete. Uh, it was uh, a combination of agile methodology. But at one point, the leadership team decided to pause because things were not working well. Not pause that we go for seven weeks of vacation, but seven weeks to rethink how we work. We created different subgroups, for, for example, co focusing on how we are taking decisions, how are we going to prepare for build. I was responsible for engagement of people to the project. And guess what we discovered? We actually discovered that not everybody is understanding the vision, the purpose. So what we did, we reinvested time in vision, in purpose. We also identified behaviors that will take us there, yeah? And situation really changed. So there are a lot of examples when we can stop and think, are we going towards direction? Are we going to reach our destination? Or are we simply blindly following the purpose? So I stop now here again to see if there are any questions but, so you know the drill now try try to think of uh, the actual question that uh, kasha is uh, challenging challenging you with and uh, um, before um, you, you get there um, maybe just uh, just as a reminder kasha there's uh, one of the questions is if you can repeat the formula for trust perhaps you can write it in the slide deck before distribution and um, I definitely will. And I actually will add a couple more slides. Uh, very good, because I have, I have everything. Uh, it was great pleasure. Excellent. There's, there's a question about uh, um, from Matt F. about uh, um, he's saying that your example seems to be more about challenging and changing a bad process rather than being simply purpose driven. So perhaps you can you can speak to this. It's, it's a good observation. And I think my answer is that if you stop, reflect, and you modify, the por you modify the purpose, that's exactly what you are doing. You are following the purpose. Excellent. Uh, th there's a previous question that from, from the previous session, but I think that it does a relevance uh, in, in terms of how you interact and uh, you connect. And uh, the, the, the reflection is more, how do you see people? This was still in the framework of trust uh, as by default, as friends or, or foes. And how does this impact uh, in an underlying way how we interact with others? Uh, do I see people as friends or at fault? Oh, as foes, as enemies. Aha, uh -huh, okay, good. Well, I, 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 I personally, I always look at people as friends with this terminology. I believe, I believe everybody has good intentions. And that's what I learned during the humanitarian work. 
that there is no right or wrong answer to a question, but there is a different view. And this is so important to get into shoes of other people to truly see why they think the way they think. They probably have a reason. I'm sure that you've seen this picture with six, yeah? From one side, it looks like nine, and from the other one, like six. And people will argue. One will say it's six, another one will, will argue nine. And I see it frequently in life, it's happening, yeah? So, so there is a different perception depending uh, wh where we stand. But I do believe that everybody has a good in, um, intentions. Maybe I correct myself. I believe that 999 people out of 1,000 have good intentions. And yes, occasionally you run people who have good intentions from their perspective, but it's not aligned with majority of people. And, and I usually walk around those people. So I probably have met two or three individuals like this in my life. There's a there's a question about uh, um, alignment uh, uh, from from Marco, and the question is how do you make sure every team member is driven by the same purpose? So first of all, you have to define what the purpose is, right? So with the example of Roche doing now what patients need next, it's for one hundred thousand employees, and this is already a good vision. Because when I wake up in the morning on Monday and I don't feel like working, I'm just thinking about this person doing now what patients need next. And it already motivates me. But okay, you say that this is very broad. So again, example from my project, the one that I already was sharing with you, we learned that this vision was actually not well understood and people have different perspectives in mind. Yeah. So what, what, what we did, we redefined, we identified the behaviors, but now we need to internalize it. So on this particular project, we created so-called engagement group. We have ident because it's a big project, okay? It's huge. I don't even want to tell you how big it is, but we need to have this engagement crew that then in my role as an OCM lead, I was driving them and they were engaging their teams, their colleagues. So very specific example. When we start a sprint, we would start with the vision. We would see, we would read this vision. We would have one minute discussion, still if we remember what it is. And then at the end of the meeting, we would reflect back, how did we follow the vision? We also, um, we also have had the behavior scars. And then if somebody was not following the behaviors, we would show the sign, you are in a victim loop, meaning not really following the behaviors that we decided to follow. But it was in a jokeful way, yeah? Kind of see it, look at it, it's a message for you. So because it was accountability loop versus, um, versus victim loop. So that's what you can do. You have to internalize and and I gave you a couple of examples how we have addressed on one of my projects. Um, thank you. I think we should uh, move on. I don't see any other points. If it's okay with you, we could move to the next uh, point, uh, Kasia. All right. We have two more points, two very important. So maximize learnings. It's not about minimizing risks. And that's pretty much answer the questions. As project managers, as leaders, we always try to minimize risks. And uh, what I appreciate in few project programs that I've recently been, it's actually releasing control of senior leaders into empowering team and uh, taking calculated risks. And if you want to fail, fail fast because you can definitely learn something from it. So I would like to give you um, one example from China. I didn't yet talk about China where I took calculated risk and it actually worked very well. 
a very similar situation as I was in Nigeria. When I came, again, you have this group of expats who complain about local people, Chinese people, and then you have Chinese people who really try to do their, their best. And I very quickly discovered how good, how pragmatic they are. However, they didn't want to take responsibility. It's, it's, it's a culture of hierarchies. And uh, they would be so timid. They were not fully doing what they could do because they were so afraid if something goes wrong, they would be blamed. And after being there for one month, uh, I talked to the management team, part of my team, and I said, look, I really would like for you to own it. You drive it. If something goes wrong, I personally will take responsibility because I was working as the pro program manager. And it did work. It did work so well that this project was supposed to last two years and we were done after one year. It was also ERP implementation. So I encourage you to take those calculated risks. Yeah, I did take the risk because I didn't know how it will go. I observed them for one month and now back to trust. I really trust that they will do a great job and they, and they really did. So trust here is important because when you wouldn't release control, if you actually don't trust somebody, right? The more you trust, the more control you can release. And the more control you release, you can experiment more. You can take more calculated risks. You can fail faster, recover, and move on. I put here a bullet for experimentational change management. That's what we started doing recently. So you do not follow a typical process of implementing change, but you set short term experiments and you see what they will produce. And then based on the result, then you may still continue or you create another experiment. In my case, um, we have established a team called Empowered to Experiment. And for every month, we have set different behavioral experiments, how we want to collaborate together. And then after one month, we would reflect. And, I, and it was actually in a crisis moment when things really didn't work. And we decided what behaviors we want to practice. After one month, we reflected back. And this all together lasted for four months. After four months, we decided to stop it because actually we fixed everything that we wanted to fix, yeah? But this is this experimentational change management uh, that I call it, but trust here is extremely important. It is much easier if you are working with the team that trust each other. And, you know, of course I could give you a lot of other examples for taking those calculated risks, but I stop here because maybe there are some comments and maybe you can quickly reflect back in your current work environment. Is this something that you would like to experiment? Another thing you may experiment, note when you have to prepare a strategy, a testing strategy, a data migration strategy, a communication strategy, who is signing it off? Rarely experts and quite frequently senior leaders who are not the experts. And I would love to do an experiment. The power goes to the experts. Of course, a senior leader can review and provide the feedback, but I would like that the signatures there are of experts. I personally believe it will build much higher motivation for those experts rather than being the ones who write the documents, but then they are not signing it off. All right, I stop to see if there are any comments, questions. Um, Kasha, I don't see comments or questions. So I don't know if Leon, I don't know if you see some things I did not see. No, it's okay. I think we can go to the next uh, slide. We have 20 minutes. 
So, ah, because we still have a video which we most yes. like to not so what, I, what I would also suggest is if there are uh, more questions to this topic that, that pop up, don't, don't hesitate to write and, and, uh, and see if Kasha can take the, at the very end, okay? Great. So, good. I will try to be quick. I would like to share with you uh, first two events in my life that really opened my eyes. So, back to China. And I was hiking there with five Chinese and three Europeans, and we were going to the camping site. We were supposed to camp, but we were going through high mountains. We were hiking for about seven, eight hours carrying tents. And then all of a sudden, behind the big mountain, we've seen our destination. And right there in our destination, there is a big, ugly, mobile or television tower like a dinosaur and three of us europeans we've got so upset we couldn't see anything but just this tower and complaining why did you bring us here can we camp somewhere else three of us two germans and i we were just walking around being upset trying to find where else we can camp but there was no other place to camp. There was water there and everything else. And after two hours, I was like, wait a second, where there are our Chinese colleagues? They were on a side, on a rock, looking at beautiful sunset. The ugly tower was in their back. They were taking pictures, looking at beautiful views. It was such an eye opener for me because we, three Europeans, all what we could see was this ugly tower and we missed to see the beauty around us, mountains and the sunset. Another example, when I was doing ski touring where you have to ski down through the forest where it's very steep. It was first time in my life I had to ski through the forest. And I told to the guide, his name was Paul. I said, Paul, how do you expect me to ski down? There is a tree here, there is a tree here, there is a tree there. And he says, Kasia, wrong thinking. You don't look at the trees, you look what's in between the trees. And those two stories really opened my mind how frequently at work we are looking at things that are actually not important, whether weaknesses or something that really doesn't matter. But that's literally where our attention is going, yeah? And that's why I'm saying here that take the opportunity because in each of us, in every team member, there is a slice of a genius. And if you bring us together and if you follow common purpose and you have a trust, I can guarantee you that you will be a collective genius. And I experienced this in a refugee camp in Greece. People came from all over the world, volunteers, not knowing each other, but they were following common purpose, helping refugees. We came with different skill set. Each of us had plenty of weaknesses, but we also had strengths and we were focusing on those strengths and that's why we were successful. That's why everybody had fun. And that's why I am a big proponent of focusing on strengths and stop talking about weaknesses. If you want, you can laugh at weaknesses, but really put together a slice of a genius into collective genius. So I think, Giovanni, do we have a time for video? Yes, um, I think we do. If we, if I'll, I'll try to to show. I think how. we can watch. It's seven minutes video, but it will tell you how difficult it is to unlearn. Lass nicht jede Nadini Vorsorg. Frankly, die App für deine Säule drei. Hey, it's me, Destin. Welcome back to Smarter Every Day. You've heard people say it's just like riding a bike, meaning it's really easy and you can't forget how to do it, right? But I did something. I did something that damaged my mind. It happened on the streets of Amsterdam and, and I got really scared, honestly. I, I can't ride a bike like you can anymore. Before I show you the video of what happened, I, I need to tell you the backstory. 
Like many six-year-olds with a MacGyver mullet, I learned how to ride a bike when I was really young. I had learned a life skill and I was really proud of it. Everything changed though when my friend Barney called me 25 years later. Where I work, the welders are geniuses and they like to play jokes on the engineers. He had a challenge for me. He had built a special bicycle and he wanted me to try to ride it. He had only changed one thing. When you turn the handlebar to the left, the wheel goes to the right. When you turn it to the right, the wheel goes to the left. I thought this would be easy, so I hopped on the bike, ready to demonstrate how quickly I could conquer this. And here he is, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Destin Salem. First attempt riding the bicycle. All right. So, the faster I go, the better. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I sure. couldn't do it. You can see that I'm laughing, but I'm actually really frustrated. In this moment, I had a really deep revelation. My thinking was in a rut. This bike revealed a very deep truth to me. I had the knowledge of how to operate the bike, but I did not have the understanding. Therefore, knowledge is not understanding. Look, I know what you're probably thinking. Destin's probably just an uncoordinated engineer and can't do it, but that's not the case at all. The algorithm that's associated with riding a bike in your brain is just that complicated. Think about it. Downwards force on the pedals, leaning your whole body, pulling and pushing the handlebars, gyroscopic precession in the wheels. Every single force is part of this algorithm, and if you change any one part, it affects the entire control system. I do not make definitive statements that often, but I'm telling you right now, you cannot ride this bicycle. You might think you can, but you can't. I know this because I'm often asked to speak at universities and conferences and I take the bike with me. It's always the same. People think they're going to try some trick or they're just going to power through it. It doesn't work. Your brain cannot handle this. For instance, this guy. I offered him $200 just to ride this bike 10 feet across the stage. Everybody thought he could do it. No, 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 no. No, you didn't understand. You didn't understand. So, this way. Okay. All right, I'm All right, so, uh, whatever you're at. Go ahead, go ahead. No, no, you have to keep your feet on. Dude, all right, here we go. Just give me a Wait, wait, wait. Like, you gotta start rolling at least. Feet on the pedal. Go. <laughs> Go right off. <laughs> Just keep your feet on the pedals. Hands on. Yeah, come on. Once you have a rigid way of thinking in your head, sometimes you cannot change that, even if you want to. So here's what I did. It was a personal challenge. I stayed out here in this driveway and I practiced about five minutes every day. My neighbors made fun of me. I had many wrecks, but after eight months, this happened. One day I couldn't ride the bike and the next day I could. It was like I could feel some kind of pathway in my brain that was now unlocked. It was really weird though. It's like there's this trail in my brain, but if I wasn't paying close enough attention to it, my brain would easily lose that neural path and jump back onto the old road it was more familiar with. Any small distractions at all, like a cell phone ringing in my pocket, would instantly throw my brain back to the old control algorithm and I would wreck. But at least I could ride it. My son is the closest person to me genetically, and he's been riding a normal bike for three years. That's over half his life. I wanted to know how long it would take him to learn how to ride a backwards bike, so I told him if he learned how to ride a backwards bike, he could go with me to Australia and meet a real astronaut. Are you going to give up? No. Go ahead. This is how it starts. Look at this. This is such a big deal. Get up, you got it. Did you see his brain get it? So he, in, how many weeks have we been doing this? Two weeks? In two weeks, he did something that took me eight months to do, which demonstrates that a child has more neuroplasticity, am I even saying that right, than an adult. It's clear from this experiment that children have a much more plastic brain than adults. That's why the best time to learn a language is when you're a young child. All right, today's bike log. I can ride smooth, I can ride fast. I'm thinking the experiment is over. Okay, now I'm in Amsterdam, a city that has more bicycles than people. The question is, can I ride a normal bike now? I mean, I've spent all this time unlearning how to ride a bike. If I go back and try to ride a normal one, will my brain mess up? So I've tweeted a Smarter Every Day meetup, if you will, and I'm gonna see if somebody brings a bicycle and I'm gonna try to ride a normal bike. 
It's backwards. It's backwards. This was one of the most frustrating moments of my life. I had ridden a normal bike since I was six, but in this moment, I couldn't do it anymore. I had set out to prove that I could free my brain from a cognitive bias. But at this point, I'm pretty sure that all I proved is that I could only redesignate that bias. So what you're not seeing is just a group of people here looking at me, looking at the strange American <laughs> that can't ride a bike because they think I'm dumb. But I'm actually two levels deep into this because I've learned and unlearned. All right. After 20 minutes of making a fool out of myself, suddenly my brain clicked back into the old algorithm. I can't explain it, but it happened in a very specific moment. Got it, got it, got it. I'm back. Yeah, yeah. Oh, click, click, click. Hold it, click. I got it, I got it. Okay, there it is. There was the moment. Good. Okay, I can ride a bike. I tried to explain this to the people around me, and they just didn't get it. They thought I was faking the previous 20 minutes, and I couldn't get anybody to believe me. That looked like I faked that, didn't it? Yeah. Just a fake. Yes. You think I'm faking? You don't believe me. That's so Actually. weird. You're like, no, 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 no. You think I'm lying, don't yeah, you? I I'm not lying. <laughs> I felt like the only person on the planet who had ever unlearned how to ride a bike, and I couldn't articulate it to anyone because everybody just knew that you can't forget how to ride a bike. So I learned three things from this experiment. I learned that welders are often smarter than engineers. I learned that knowledge does not equal understanding. And I learned that truth is truth, no matter what I think about it. So be very careful how you interpret things because you're looking at the world with a bias, whether you think you are or not. I'm Destin. You're getting smarter every day. Have a good one. Okay, if you want to support Thank Smarter you, Every Day, you can download a free audio book at Audible. We can close it now. So, um, can you hear me? I... Yes, loud and clear. Okay, great. So, I really wanted for you to see this video because it's it's quite powerful, and I'm catching myself because all four elements that we have discussed, it appears to be so easy, such as focus on strength and not on the weaknesses. It's not easy, it's not easy. We have a natural tendency to focus on weaknesses. A simple thing to follow the purpose, it's not easy. We forget what is our vision and we just go with the process that we have agreed. To release, I think, the most difficult for leaders, not necessarily senior leaders, but any leaders, to release your control, it's very difficult. It requires practice. This bike, biking to the left, white wheels goes to the right. I think it's a perfect example for releasing control. It's very difficult. I said that trust helps, but even if you have trust, it helps, right? And then finally, to unlearn that you know everything is the best, I think it's also tough. So just one more slide with three takeaways. Um, the last slide on the other page is, I would like to encourage you to be brave to experiment, to do things differently that you normally do them. And actually, if something gets not broken, break it to see what happens, because you can discover a lot of things. And the most important, whatever you experiment, experiment, remember that human relationship is the most important. Just simply asking somebody, how are you? Thank you. Saying, I'm sorry, matters so much. So thank you very much for this official part. And uh, if we have some questions or if we could have comments, discussion, one thing, Giovanni, that we I would encourage to experiment is somehow with virtual technology, bring opportunity to have a discussion. So thank you very much, Kasia, for, for this. I am monitor the Q&A. Um, I think we do need a, about five minutes at the end for... Um, so we have three minutes. We have, a, we, have a, we have about three minutes if there are... The full three minutes, you're right. And uh, I do not know if, uh, if, if I'm missing questions, Leon, uh, help me out, but I don't see... So I, I would say if, from the audience, if there are maybe one or two questions now, there will be enough time. Well, we have a comment from Noemi regarding the uh, 
the situation with uh, with COVID and, and uh, jeopardizing. It's, it's worth, you can read it. It's not really uh, for, for the presentation. And regards from Stefan, he could not uh, find, uh, stay longer, but the rest is done. So maybe you can jump into your slides, uh, okay. Giovanni. So this is the Q and A, but yep. I, I wanted to I wanted to thank uh, first of all I wanted to thank Kasha for this wonderful presentation. Uh, it's an extremely rich and inspiring presentation, and I also enjoyed very much the um, the video at the end. And certainly, I like the way that you tried, uh, Kasha, to build uh, a different way of, of interacting, even though the, the platform sometimes it's it's a bit uh, challenging for that. Um, I wanted to uh, attract some attention to to the next uh, um, events, uh, which are a little bit uh, more more dry and back into the project management, the traditional Gantt or Agile, and not both. Maybe we have to unlearn to use one or the other and learn to use both. And there's also a, a building your personal brand masterclass, and uh, that is going to be an uh, in-person event uh, as much as possible in uh, April next year. I wanted to thank, and then again, uh, taking a, a hint from Kasha today, the, so you, you see uh, now the photos of the people that are making this possible. So you heard Leon's voice. You've not heard uh, or seen uh, Aisatu and Pia, but they're actually the people that are making this possible in the background and spent several hours making sure that everything was working today. So I wanted to, to thank them very much. They spent every week uh, at least once or twice online. So they have a ton of experience. And uh, again, they are not seen or heard, but they're indispensable to the success of tonight's event. And I wanted to, to thank all the people um, that made it possible. For uh, those of you that are, um, PMI customers and, and PMP certified, uh, you have uh, the claim uh, code for your PDUs. Uh, the PDUs tonight are for leadership. It's one PDU for leadership and one credit. And I think Kasha has done an excellent job at uh, presenting a lot of uh, material for, and food for thought for, for leaders. And uh, I would uh, really appreciate if you could take some time and uh, maybe now as your um, mind is still on the topic uh, to either take um, a snapshot of the QR code or use the URL indicated to just to give some feedback about the session today. There's actually a couple of self-reflection questions. What are you taking home from today in the survey? And that's uh, also on purpose because um, when you reflect on what you're taking home, there's a higher chance you take that home. And that's one of the reasons why we're doing these events also to, um, yeah, to, to challenge ourselves to learn something. And uh, especially today to try to, to learn to unlearn. While we are uh, on this uh, slide, I think the, I think that's, that's really the, the, the last one. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring it back up. And um, if there are more questions now, or if there are other points, uh, we, can, um, uh, we can take the next three minutes to, to, to do that. So we have a comment from, uh, uh, from Matt. And uh, Matt is thanking you, Kasha, for your insights and very interesting and thought provoking. And he agrees that challenging the status quo, status quo is essential. And it's also essential to get to know the culture of the people that you work with. Otherwise, your challenges may not be well received. So I don't know if you want to comment on that. And uh, to Ray, in the meantime, I believe the leadership PDU is, uh, uh, there's one, uh, it's 1.0, not 1.5. So Kasha, about... Uh, yeah, Matt, make, Matt made um, a, such a perfect statement that you have to adapt to every culture. But then, you know, I, I would like to give you this example from Guatemala because you are so right. I tried to follow the process because um, I am the project manager. And I tell you, after my first two weeks in Guatemala, my, my, my goal was to teach them PMN. 
And I brought the team together and for one week I tried to teach them what the PMN is all about. And it was so inappropriate. This culture is not about planning, organizing. This culture is a culture of a moment here and now. And you can plan within here and now. And what I tried to do was so inappropriate. I learned very quickly. I failed at the very beginning. I paid for it. It took me three months to regain the trust of the people. So your, your comment is just on the spot. Uh, thank you so much, Kasia. And uh, as we are wrapping up and uh, we're, we are aiming to close on time, uh, I wanted to, to thank you here and now, in the here and now. I, from my side, I learned a lot from you. I am very grateful that uh, you stepped forward and you kept stepping forward and you just didn't give up also on the, on the digital online experience. And um, with this, I'd like to uh, close uh, today's webinar. And I, I hope that you're gonna have a safe and serene end of the end of the year. And uh, I hope and I wish to see most of you and as many of you live as possible next year. Thank you very much, Giovanni. I greatly appreciate and thank you to all of you for listening to me. Um, I really appreciate that you didn't depart but stayed here for this entire time. So wishing everybody a wonderful holiday season. Thank you, Giovanni. Thank you, team. It was really nice to collaborate with you. Thank you, Kasia. So I will stay on until the, uh, yep. the webinar team closes the event. <laughs> and, uh, Thank you all for joining today. Thank you.